Welcome to chapter 17, Blood, part two of two. In part one, uh, we had a brief introduction about blood as a connective tissue. We identified its three formed elements. Uh, we then went on to discuss blood plasma and then finished up with one of the formed elements known as an erythrocyte or a red blood cell. In this lecture, part two, uh, we will discuss the other two formed elements of blood known as leukocytes or white blood cells and platelets. For each of those, we will talk about the production of them as well as their functions. We will see different types of white blood cells um, and then from there we will finish up with hemostasis or the steps required to stop bleeding. If you recall from chapter 17, part 1, leukocytes are different from erythrocytes in that there are several different types. With red blood cells, we just had red blood cells. However, leukocytes can be divided into two categories, and it really just depends on if that cell has cytoplasmic granules or does it stain a specific color. If cytoplasmic granules or little spots are present, they are categorized as a granulocyte. And vice versa, if the cell does not contain those stained granules in the cytoplasm, they belong to the A granulocyte category. There are five leukocytes that you have to know. There is a mnemonic provided for you here on the screen to help you remember the order in which they appear in the blood from most abundant to least abundant. And we will see the names of these cells come up in the near future. However, for now, the mnemonic is never let monkeys eat bananas. And the first letter of each of those words will correlate to a type of leukocyte. Again, this mnemonic will help you to remember, help you to remember, um, the amount in which these white blood cells are present from most abundant to least abundant. Blood is classified as a suspension when we look at it um, as a mixture. But when you take blood or a test tube of blood rather and put it in a centrifuge and spin it around really quickly, remember all of those layers settle out. The bottom layer was red blood cells, and then we had a thin layer known as the buffy coat, which included leukocytes and platelets. Here we have the different types of leukocytes, again in order from most abundant to least abundant. Now you have their names though, but be sure to remember the mnemonic, never let monkeys eat bananas. So the order in which they are found in the blood from most abundant to least abundant is now neutrophils, lymphocytes, not to be confused with leukocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils. All of the cells that I just named off are types of white blood cells or types of leukocytes. Again, the term lymphocyte can often be confused with leukocyte. Make sure you know the difference. We will start by talking about granulocytes, which were one category of two of leukocytes. Three types of granulocytes. We have neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. What you really need to know about leukocytes is one, the order in which they occur in the blood from most abundant to least abundant, and their names, as well as a little bit about them. What do they fight in the body, or when do they multiply, or what do they multiply in response to? Neutrophils, if you remember that mnemonic, never let monkeys eat bananas, Neutrophils are the most abundant type of white blood cell found in the blood. They are fairly large, um, approximately two times the size of an erythrocyte. 
neutrophils are very phagocytic. And if you remember what phagocytosis is, um, these cells are going to engulf or ingest large debris um, or even bacteria. And that's what these cells function in response to. Neutrophils will target bacteria and they do so by ingesting that bacteria and releasing these oxidizing substances to degrade them. And those substances are either bleach or hydrogen peroxide usually. So from this slide, you should know that neutrophils are the most abundant type of leukocyte in the blood and they respond to bacteria. The next type of leukocyte that we will look at is known as an eosinophil. Now, they aren't as nearly as abundant as a neutrophil, but they do have a different role. And especially in the spring or even in the summer, we may have an increased number in eosinophils because they respond to allergies as well as asthma. We will even see eosinophils uh, multiply in response to parasites. The last type of granulocyte is known as a basophil, and these are the least abundant leukocyte um, out of the bloodstream. But they're important in that they release histamine. Now, if you have ever, or if you know anyone who has ever taken Benadryl, that is an antihistamine. What histamine does is it produces an inflammatory response um, and it causes vasodilation of certain blood vessels. Vasodilation is increasing the diameter of a blood vessel to allow for more stuff to enter. This is the opposite of what we want if we are experiencing allergies. So an antihistamine is going to vasoconstrict or make vessels smaller so less stuff can get into them. Therefore, we will have less irritants, which make us sneeze or cough or make our eyes and nose itch. We're going to shift to the other main category of leukocytes, which are the A granulocytes. And we have two types of A granulocytes known as lymphocytes and monocytes. Again, do not confuse leukocytes with lymphocytes. Leukocytes are white blood cells. Lymphocytes are a type of leukocyte or white blood cell. Lymphocytes are the second most abundant white blood cell after a neutrophil. And as their name suggests, lymph, lymphocyte, we will see them in lymphoid tissue providing immunity. So the lymph nodes that you may find in the back of your throat or even the spleen. You have to know the two types of lymphocytes and what they act against or what their function is. The first type of lymphocyte is known as a T lymphocyte or a T cell. Use that letter T to help you remember what they function in and they are going to act against tumor cells. Tumor also starts with T. The other type of lymphocyte is known as a B lymphocyte or a B cell. These types of cells will produce antibodies. There's a B in antibodies. And the very last type of leukocyte is known as a monocyte. They are the biggest of all of the white blood cells but that does not mean that they are the most abundant. Monocytes are capable of leaving the circulation or leaving blood vessels to enter the surrounding tissue. And once they do that, they kind of change into a, a macrophage. Again, macrophages use phagocytosis. They are going to engulf viruses or bacterial parasites or even infections to hopefully degrade them and digest them. In chapter 17, part one, we talked about hematopoiesis and erythropoiesis. Hematopoiesis was the formation of all blood cells and occurred in the red bone marrow found in the skeletal system. Erythropoiesis now was the production of red blood cells or erythrocytes. 
Now we have leukopoiesis, which is the production of leukocytes or white blood cells. Now there aren't entirely hormones that will stimulate leukopoiesis, uh, but we do have some important chemical messengers like interleukins or colony stimulating factors. But what you really need to take away from this is the fact that we have two stem lines or two directions in which we could go to produce leukocytes. Remember, erythrocytes came from the myeloid line. Leukocytes, however, now can branch into two pathways after we see that hemocytoblast or the hematopoietic stem cell. We have the lymphoid line, which will give rise to lymphocytes, remember T and B cells. The other line that a hemo hematopoietic stem cell could choose is the myeloid line. The myeloid line will give rise to the rest of the white blood cells, the red blood cells, and platelets. The last formed element of blood as a connective tissue is known as a platelet or the platelets. Remember, the only true cell or formed element was a white blood cell. So platelets are going to lack a nucleus. They will lack organelles. And that's because they are really just bits and pieces of larger cells that broke apart. These larger cells that eventually break apart to give rise to platelets are known as megakaryocytes. They're these enormous cells and eventually their cytoplasm fragments or it breaks off, producing platelets. Platelets are extremely important in forming platelet plugs. And we will see platelets in just a little bit as they help to uh, seal breaks in blood vessels or stop bleeding. In chapter 17, part one, we introduced a hormone known as erythropoietin. Erythropoietin was produced by mostly the kidneys um, and was there to stimulate the production of red blood cells. Now we have another hormone also released by the kidneys known as thrombopoietin, which is going to regulate the production of platelets. Again, we had two lines that this hematopoietic stem cell could choose. The lymphoid line, which will give rise to lymphocytes, and the myeloid line, which will give rise to all other formed elements, including platelets. So, after this hematopoietic stem cell decides, I'm going to go and become a platelet. It heads towards that myeloid line and differentiates into a megakaryoblast, which will eventually mature into a megakaryocyte. That megakaryocyte, or large cell, will send out its cytoplasm, and those cytoplasmic extensions will eventually break off. And once they are broken off, they are known as platelets. Here is a diagram that demonstrates the different phases that a cell will go through to ultimately become platelets. Again, all blood cells come from a hematopoietic stem cell, also known as a hemocytoblast. This is the cell that ultimately decides what type of blood cell or formed element it wants to become. If this blood cell, or if the stem cell rather, decides that it wants to become a platelet, it heads towards the myeloid line, not the lymphoid line, becomes a megakaryoblast, and then when it matures, it's known as a megakaryocyte. In that image of the megakaryocyte stage four, you can see that the cytoplasm is now extending out or projecting and eventually breaking off, which gives us platelets. We'll finish up this lecture by talking about hemostasis um, and then getting into a little bit of blood typing. But first, hemostasis. Heme or hemo means blood. Stasis means the stoppage of. Hemostasis means the stoppage of bleeding. 
in this lecture, you will learn about the three steps that are involved in order to stop bleeding. And these three steps are typical for minor tears in blood vessels, not traumatic injuries. Um, in addition to these three steps, we will see other clotting factors or substances that play an important role. But from this, you should take away the three steps, the order in which they occur, and a little bit about each step. The first thing that happens in response to an injured blood vessel or a tear or a break in a blood vessel is known as a vascular spasm. Once you tear that blood vessel or break it, that is going to stimulate um, the vasoconstriction. So remember, vasoconstriction was constricting the vessel, making it smaller. The smaller you make it, the less stuff can move through it, meaning the less blood can leave it. This vascular spasm also comes about because of the chemicals that are released once you break the blood vessel cells and the platelets that are nearby. Again, this vascular spasm will occur in smaller blood vessels or minor injuries. Step two in hemostasis is known as the platelet plug formation. So in step one, we saw maybe you fall, you scrape your knee, and you break some blood vessels. The very first thing that will happen is in response to that injured muscle in the blood vessel, we release a bunch of chemicals that ultimately cause that blood vessel to constrict. Now we have a broken blood vessel that is constricted. Since it's broken, we are exposing the structure of the vessel wall which includes a lot of collagen fibers. As platelets try to pass that injured site, they will stick to the collagen fibers. And eventually, so many stick to them and form a plug, or they temporarily seal off that break in the vessel wall. If you remember in chapter one, we only had a couple examples of a positive feedback loop in the human body. And this was one of them. As we see platelets stick to the exposed collagen fibers, those platelets will release chemicals which will stimulate more platelets to stick. And those platelets now will release more chemicals. So basically a positive feedback loop occurs when we have a response and we like that response. So we enhance it or we increase it. And the last step of hemostasis in minor blood vessel injuries is known as coagulation, or the actual clotting of blood. Remember, platelets only help to temporarily seal off the break. They are tiny little cell fragments that stick to the collagen fibers. But with coagulation now, we have a gel-like uh, texture to the blood passing by, and we have these fibrin threads that are going to serve as a mesh to effectively seal that blood vessel and reinforce the platelet plug. If you're more of a visual learner, here we have displayed the three steps that are required in hemostasis, or the stoppage of bleeding. Again, in response to a torn or broken blood vessel wall, we first see a vascular spasm. The muscle in that blood vessel is going to contract, which will cause the vessel to get smaller, known as vasoconstriction. The second step is the platelet plug formation. As we have platelets passing by the tear, they are going to stick to the exposed collagen fibers. You should note that platelets don't typically stick to blood vessels unless the collagen is exposed. As we have platelets sticking to the collagen fibers and releasing chemicals, we have more platelets starting to stick and more chemicals being released, a positive feedback loop. And the last step involved in hemostasis is known as coagulation 
we have these fibrin threads put down to form a mesh and to really reinforce that temporary clot. The human body is simply incredible when it maintains homeostasis 24 hours a day, every day. And the cardiovascular system contributes to that. The cardiovascular system includes, again, blood, blood vessels, and the heart. The cardiovascular system has all of these procedures in place in order to minimize the effects of blood loss. And the cardiovascular system is able to do that by first, you know, reducing the amount of affected blood vessels by trying to keep that injury confined to one area. The cardiovascular system also is able to recognize blood loss and in response to that will increase the production of erythrocytes. But from this slide, uh, we will briefly talk about blood typing and there are two types that you have to know, type O and type AB. Type O is known as the universal donor basically because it can be donated to anybody without risk of serious infection or serious reaction. Type AB is known as the universal recipient. An individual whose blood type is AB can receive any blood type, again, without a risk of serious reaction. Make sure you know which blood type is the universal donor and which type is the universal recipient. This was chapter 17, part two. We finished up uh, chapter 17 by talking about the last two of the three formed elements of blood, known as white blood cells and platelets. From there, we talked about hemostasis and finished up with blood typing.